Uh, we're going to start today with a little PowerPoint on um, just addressing the risks to collections. Um, so talking about um, what these risks are, how we can manage them and what to look out for. And then we're going to have a little break because um, that'll take about an hour. Um, and hopefully it'll give you a chance to get a drink or just to close your eyes briefly um, so you, you don't get a headache looking at a screen. Um, and then we'll come back and um, uh, I will hopefully um, show some practical um, skills, so some handling and cleaning techniques. So we'll run through them and I'll try and demonstrate. Uh, this is first time doing practical demonstrations over virtual um, virtual means. So hopefully it'll all be clear and we can um, we can learn something. Um, and then we'll just finish off about talking about when to seek professional help. So we'll have talked through what things you can do to look after your collections personally. Um, but then it's important to know when is that time to seek professional help? What mustn't you do on your own? Um, because collections can, uh, care of collections can get quite technical quite quickly. And the last thing any of us want to do is cause any damage. So what are the risks to collections? So the first one I'm going to talk about, and I'm sure um, this is very um, evident to most of you, is physical forces. So obviously many objects can be um, damaged by physical force. So for example, this chandelier has fallen over and uh, bent out of shape. And um, these objects from the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, um, quite a few years ago now, were knocked over by someone who fell walking down the stairs um, and obviously broken out of all recognisable shape. Other so they can be catastrophic physical damage, like catastrophic physical damage like that, so complete destruction. Um, or they can be little physical damages. So for instance, this, this um, small tear in a painting canvas, um, which unfortunately does take quite a bit to repair, even though it is quite small. But as well as instances of um, catastrophic damage. There's also the damage that you can get over time. So wear and tear, things that you don't necessarily notice until something starts to change. Um, so for instance, is visitors in your museum or um, these pictures were taken from a historic house. Um, if things are open on open display or people have to walk on them. So for instance, it's carpets, walls, um, people can brush past them, obviously they have to walk over them. So these photos just show the wear and tear that can happen. So on the left, this, um, the wallpaper and the, and the doorway, um, you can see some losses down the side where people have brushed past it and the carpet where people have walked over it. Actually, this is not visitors, this is where um, where um, people who care for the collection, so people who work in the house, every morning and every night stepped over the stanchions on this particular carpet to close the shutters. So that's not even visitor accumulation, that's just twice a day movement over that carpet. And over many years, you can see it's starting to wear away. And physical damage is of most risk um, during change of use of spaces. So for instance, during events, um, sometimes filming in places as well is quite common. Oh. Sorry, whiz past that. So for instance, this is Elton Palace. Normally um, house open to visitors set as in the left photo, but it's also used for concerts and events. So set at as the right photo. So this involves moving collections, it involves increased use of space, so open after hours, so more wear and tear, 
potentially damage from moving the collections, but also damage from potentially introduction of food and drink. And um, so there's all sorts of things to think about managing risk and physical damage um, when you are using your museum or historic house um, for anything other than open visit visitors, anything that causes change. Sorry, my computer is uh, being a little bit um, eager. So as well as change of space, change of use, building works is also a major risk of physical damage. Um, they also always involves lots of equipment, so scaffolding, also use use of um, equipment that's not generally used, um, so hot hot implements, uh, which may cause them um, a, a different kind of risk from fire, um, but also people who are not necessarily used to working in a historic space. So you can see quite. Um, uh, lovely in this photo, um, the little statues on top of the roof has been dressed in high vis to highlight them um, for the people building the scaffold around them. So you've got to think about what needs protecting and how you can protect that. And it's also important to um, to educate visitors on what touch and physical damage can do to objects particularly wear and tear, because that's something that you don't see straight. Um, so this is an English Heritage touch board. So over time, visitors have touched the right hand side of each of these squares and they can see what their touch does to materials. So, for example, fragile materials such as silk, it's completely worn away. The um, white cotton polyester, you can see the staining from um, people, the dirt from people's fingers. You can see the silver leaf on the right has worn away as well. So it's just about realising that actually just because you can't see instantaneous damage it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not happening and that's the hardest to understand. And here's a close-up of the um, staining and the worn silk. But it's, it's not just um, visitors that cause physical damage, um, as custodians of historic collections, we have to care and clean for our collections. And unfortunately, we can also cause inadvertent damage. Um, so this close up shows an image of um, not inappropriate cleaning or not quite conservation cleaning. So you can see um, the strands of the cleaning material stuck in the fibre. Um, so, for instance, sometimes you can see on wooden furniture where it's been dusted with one of them bright yellow dusters. Um, so the fibres from the dusters can get caught, leaving little yellow fibres um, in, in the material. So we do have to be aware that although we're trying to care for these things, we do have to be careful in the way we're doing it because cleaning is a cause of physical damage and also a cause of wear and tear. So cleaning is necessary, but you've got to be aware that every time you clean, you wear a bit of the material away. So it's about balancing um, cleaning with um, preserving the object. So we'll leave physical forces there for now and move on to light. Light damage is cumulative and irreversible. So it's important to understand and know what the risks are so that we can prevent these. So you can see here, this is um, Elton Palace as well. And um, the light from the high windows in the Great Hall um, is shining on the tapestries and the furniture at the other side of the room. And this means these high light levels are causing damage to them objects. So primarily light can cause fading. Um, you can see in this photo, this tapestry and um, the bottom end has been bent up for a long time and therefore protected from light damage. So you can see the change in color between the really deep, lovely blue at the bottom and the more sort of dull, dark blue at the top right. 
And that's just from light damage. So the bottom end has been protected and the upper has not been protected. And that is irreversible. So you will never be able to bring the dark blue, dull blue back to the bright blue of the bottom, although it did used to look like that. And um, certain colours and compounds are more susceptible to light damage than others. Um, oops. So going back to this photo, um, so organic pigments um, are more um, susceptible to light damage than inorganic pigments. Um, so often tapestries often appear blue. Um, so grass and trees often appear blue where they used to be green. And it's the yellow component, the yellow dye, that's more susceptible to fading than the blue, which means that the green has lost its yellow component and then turned to blue. So that's why when we look at things and they don't look quite right, it may be due to light damage and fading. Um, so this is <laughs> another example, um, two, two leaflets here, identical leaflets, but one has been stored on top of the other. So one has been protected from light, the one on the left, they're the original colours, and the one on the right has suffered bleaching and, and fading. Um, and that is irreversible. But it's not just textiles and paper and pigments that um, suffer from light damage. Um, wood is also susceptible. So you can see on the left, um, the piano has been stored with its lid up. So you can see the lid of the piano is beautiful dark wood, um, but above that, where the keyhole is, it's very faded. Um, so that's the part that hasn't been protected by the lid being up, and that's faded. But wood can also darken with light damage. So the image on the right, the cabinet, you can see the open door showing the drawers. That's a lighter colour because it's been protected from light than the door on the right, which has darkened due to light damage. And, and this depends on what surface coatings the wood's been subjected to. So some lacquers and waxes can darken due to light. And as well as fading, light can cause physical damage, structural damage, um, particularly such with textiles such as silk, um, it causes photochemical changes um, that weaken the material, leading to eventual loss. Um, so you can see with the photo at the bottom with the two slippers and the one on the left has been protected from light and looks very good. The one on the right has been on display, not protected from light and um, it's looking a bit worse for wear with losses. And again here, um, curtains are particularly susceptible because they're near windows, um, which are light sources. And um, this, this silk backed object as well has suffered structural damage. So light is one of the most damaging causes of deterioration and does cause permanent damage. But light is not just one thing, it is a component of um, many different wavelengths, and some of which are more damaging than others. We tend to worry about visible light and ultraviolet light because they are in our museums and they cause damage. Um, ultraviolet radiation is the most damaging and causes photochemical change. So this is the light that causes structural damage as well as fading. Um, ultraviolet light is not needed to see by and therefore we can actually um, remove it from our museums and historic houses um, by using UV film on windows. So this is a light monitor, it's measuring the UV. Um, on the left without the film, 218 uh, microwatts per lumen and on the right through UV film that's gone down to zero. So putting UV film on windows is a great way to remove UV light. 
Um, some artificial light sources emit UV light. Um, however, newer sources such as LEDs do not. So it's important to use, if possible, to upgrade to LEDs. Or if you do have um, older fluorescent tungsten sources of lighting, it's important to install filters on your lights to prevent the UV emitted um, spreading onto nearby objects. Visible light you can't exclude completely because people do need to see the objects they have come to see. So, um, however, it is important to limit light levels. Um, so if your museum is not open, um, it's important to use blinds or shutters, switch off lights to lower you, um, light levels. Um, in historic houses, it's a bit more complex as people do tend to like to see the house in its natural environment. So therefore the view out the window is very much part of the experience of visiting the house. Um, so in these places, they've come up with um, what's called unimesh uni blinds where you can see out, but it does limit light levels coming in. And of course, um, blackouts such as shutters um, in storage areas, it's, it's great to block out windows completely um, so that you are really limiting light levels. Uh, also, um, if you cover up objects, um, so for example, during closed seasons where you can't um, remove light sources such as windows, then you can cover up vulnerable objects like this. This chair has a cover on. And for very vulnerable objects, you can employ um, devices such as um, cover-ups that visitors can remove to see and then replace um, to reduce light levels um, so that people can still experience the objects. But when visitors aren't interested in them, they are not lifting the lid and they are protected. Um, so here we've got a picture of the front flag, which is very visible, fa visibly faded, and the back flag, which has been protected by the front flag and therefore more colourful. Um, so some museums employ rotations so that all, if they have multiple um, variations of the same object, um, they move them on display so that they fade at the same rate. Other museums employ um, a, a different tactic. So they display one object which fades, but they protect the other one in the state that it was originally in. Um, so they sacrifice one object to save the other. Um, there is also the um, option of facsimiles, so displaying a replica, um, although visitors tend to like to see the real thing. Um, it's important always to acknowledge when you have used a facsimile. We measure light levels, um, for example, by using blue wool standards. So these are dyed blue materials um, that fade at a set rate. So you can measure the fade and show at what rate your object might fade at the given exposure. And then you can make a decision as to whether this is too quick or too slow or okay for display or whether the object needs to be rotated or taken off display. The other thing about light is that direct sunlight can also cause increased temperatures. Um, so this is an infrared camera which shows that actually the hot spots on the wall from the sunlight increases the temperature in that particular area. And this um, takes us on to the next, the next risk to collections, which is incorrect relative humidity, which is very closely to rem um, related to incorrect temperature. Um, relative humidity is a measure of humidity in the air, so water vapour in the air, um, i.e. is it damp, is it dry, 
So it's a measurement, um, relative humidity is a percentage, um, which is very useful to us. So 100% humidity is very damp, 0% uh, is very dry, but normally it's somewhere towards the middle, so 50% RH. And that's the RH that humans prefer, but it's also the RH that most objects prefer. So in high RH, there are many mechanisms that take place um, that cause damage to objects. For example, metals, such as the railings in this picture, can corrode. Um, so the damp conditions um, increase the likeliness of metal corrosion. It, high RH also increases the likelihood of mould growth. Um, so these are the tunnels under Dover Castle. Um, it has a very um, high spec air conditioning system that was accidentally turned off overnight, um, over a weekend, I believe. And this is what greeted everyone um, when they came back to the tunnels. The air conditioning system being switched off had led to very high RH levels, which had led to a very quick growth of mould on organic surfaces. And as well as R8, high RH, mould prefer, prefers, um, in particular, objects with um, organic residues. So this um, accumulation of mould here is where the operator used to hold their hand. So accumulation of human skin cells and sweat, and that's where the mould has preferred to grow as opposed to on other surfaces. And again, some more mould here. Um, so we can measure RH, we can monitor it. Um, one of the most basic ways in which to do this is this little guy. Um, so you may um, still get these in some Christmas crackers, the fortune teller miracle fish and it's meant to curl up. There we are, Move, moves the head in jealousy, moving tail in difference, and so on. But what really makes it work is relative humidity. So when you put it on your hand, depending on how damp your hand is, um, that is what makes it curl up or behave the way it does, because it's a plastic that's very sensitive to relative humidity. Um, so as well as corrosion and mould, and fluctuating RH, as well as high RH um, causes mould and corrosion, but fluctuating RH can cause um, objects to warp, particularly wooden objects. So you can see that the, the top fold over layer of this table has warped out of shape, um, and that's due to fluctuating RH. So um, high RH fluctuating to low RH over and over again can cause the water content in objects to fluctuate um, and that causes them to expand and contract and eventually they warp out of shape. And again, this object here, this piano, this harpsichord. The lid of the keyboard instrument has warped out of shape and the little catch securing the lid has broken because of that physical force of the warping. And as well as warping, so the expansion and contraction of surfaces, when um, many furniture objects have um, veneers, so a top thin layer of different wood applied on top for a decorative effect. And because the two different woods expand and contract at different rates, um, they can um, become detached as this process repeats. So you often get lifting veneers or loss to veneers during fluctuating RH conditions. But we can um, control and monitor um, these effects. So um, on the right, there's um, a very basic way of monitoring the RH, which is an RH strip. And it gives you um, a general idea of where your RH is. So where the color changes, um, so you read between the blue and pink colours. Uh, 
it's not very accurate because that's very opinionated <laughs> as to where the blue and pink uh, differ. So that's probably, well, somewhere between 40 and 60 percent now, I think. Um, but there are more accurate ways of measuring humidity. So um, electronic devices um, that measure the humidity. You might have some in your museums, tiny tags, Hanwell systems, Miko systems. And uh, there are also ways to control unacceptable RH. So dehumidifiers, humidifiers, and conservation heating. Um, so at high temperatures, um, air can hold more water than at low temperatures. So by raising the heat in the room, you are lowering the relative humidity. And in this country, it is generally, um, we are generally trying to lower RH because we are quite a damp country. So in general, our buildings are quite damp and we are trying to make them drier. However, that's not the case every, everywhere in every museum. It's very um, building specific. And there are also microclimates we can create to protect individual objects. So if you don't, if it's, if you have particularly vulnerable materials that need a very dry environment, um, then you don't have to control your whole museum to that, that RH, you can just control the in particular object. So leaving relative humidity behind for now, um, another risk to our objects is theft. Um, so here there's a very poignant display, um, the two empty portraits, the two empty frames on the walls um, are um, representing two, two portraits that were stolen from this um, historic place. Um, and instead of hiding the fact that they were stolen, they decided to keep the display um, to to promote, but to show awareness of art theft and the problems that has caused this museum. Um, many of our collections are quite valuable, or we have some objects that are valuable. So security is very important. And connected to the theft is vandalism. Um, so very close to collected physical damage as well. Um, so these statues in Chiswick, you can see the one closest looks fine, but the one furthest away has been vandalised um, and has had his head smashed in the process. And this is obviously not ideal. So we need to protect from this as well. And this is the Night Watch by Rembrandt, and it is notoriously the most vandalised artwork currently the most vandalised artwork. It's been vandalised about three times, I think, and um, has been restored each time. Um, but obviously every time something is vandalised, it loses a little bit of value. And there's also an increased cost in trying to repair. So moving on, um, water, which obviously is very closely connected to RH, except um, uh, more visible, so um, it can cause damage more quickly. So water in the form of flooding or even small spillages. So on the left, you can see the ring caused by a plant pot, um, which has been watered um, regularly in this house. However, when people have watered it, they've not been quite as careful as they should have been. And over time, it's spillages have caused the pot to leave a ring or a, a watermark on the floor, which is irremovable. On the right, um, slightly more catastrophic event of um, flooding, which can obviously damage structure of buildings and also the collections, and can also have knock-on effects with high RH for collections that aren't necessarily affected by the flood water itself. Flood water can often be contaminated, so you've got um, not just objects being wet, but objects being um, wet and dirty and smelly and toxic. 
Um, so there are a lot of problems uh, surrounded by water. And obviously fire, which is a major catastrophic risk. Um, the top is the fire at Clandon, which um, obviously happened quite a while ago now, but it's still talked about as Clandon is um, still, the recovery of Clandon is, is still being worked on today. Um, and obviously more recently, the fire at Notdown, which, in which um, much of the structure, the higher structure and um, yes, <laughs> the roof was completely destroyed. So, so we fire, there are things we can do. It is a catastrophic event. Um, it's not very likely, so we might not worry about it quite as much as we should. However, when it happens, it is uh, a very, it has a big effect. So we need to prevent it where possible, which means using electricity safely. Many fires are caused by electrical faults. Um, so not overloading plug sockets, um, not um, storing empty cardboard boxes in areas um, where um, if a fire caught hold, it just increases the combustible material and increases the ferocity of the fire. Um, and introducing um, prevention me measures, um, for example, um, here in Germany, um, you can see that most of the roof has been destroyed by a fire, except for that small portion. And the reason why is that they had compartmentalization. So this door was shut, it's a fire door. This is where the compartment um, that ends. And on the other side of that door, that room is completely fine. The books are fine. It's been saved because of compartmentalization. So there are things we can do to prevent the spread of a fire. And working closely with your local fire brigade as well is also um, good to um, reduce the risk of fire. They will tell you um, what things you're doing well, what things you need to improve on, and also have having familiarization visits and activities with the fire service so that if there is a fire, they know um, where to go, what to do, how to access your building, and your staff know how to work with the fire brigade. Um, so this is an, an exercise at English Heritage property. And it's also be good, good to be prepared. So if there is a fire, which collections do you save first? Um, the fire brigade, if they are able to get the fire under control or to, to slow it spreading, they will help to salvage materials. They did at Notre Dame, they did at Clandon. Um, they are trained um, and it is in their, their, um, their guidelines to help preserve life, but also to preserve um, historic collections. Um, so if they know what they're going in for, if they have plans, then they're more likely to save more things. And also being prepared for things that can't be moved. Um, so fire blankets, making sure they're measured out um, for particular objects, knowing where they're stored so that they can throw, be thrown over in an emergency. And to have your response um, response to emergencies um, developed so that if the worst does happen, you know how to deal with it. Um, for instance, who will you call in to help? Do you have a conservation team or helpers that you can call on um, to come and, and salvage your collections after they've been removed from a flooded or fire damaged building? So we'll leave um, fire there and move on to pollution. Um, there are many different types of pollutants that affect different materials. Here you can see two silver spoons. Um, silver um, is affected by um, sulfur compounds. So the bright spoon on the right has been polished, um, but the spoon on the left has um, been exposed to sulfur pollutants and has um, um, turned black with the buildup of silver sulfide. 
And many um, sources of pollutants come from display materials themselves. You've got to be careful when choosing display materials because um, if they're not inert, then they potentially emit pollutants that can affect your collections. So for instance, this jewelry, jewelry, jewelry display, they've tried to seal um, the display board because they knew it was pollutant. But as soon as you put holes in it, such as um, the staples, that will allow pollutants to um, be emitted. And so the back of this silver pin has um, been, um, has become tarnished because of that. Um, so lead is also a very vulnerable metal towards pollutants and volatile organic compounds can cause cause lead to deteriorate quite quickly. And here you can see also the strip of weakened material down, down the paper is in the same place as the break in the frame, which has allowed pollutants and acidic compounds to, um, to enter and cause discoloration and damage to the paper. Um, moving on to pests. Um, we hopefully have um, all in our museums got some pest, um, pest trapping, pest um, management systems. Um, they can cause quite severe damage to objects. Um, so for instance, to wooden objects, furniture beetle, death watch beetle, um, to textile objects, taxidermy, so moths and carpet beetles cause holes, they can um, cause structural damage. And this poor monkey has been attacked by moths as well. And it's about thinking um, about preventing um, pests from entering a museum. So removing sources of food and harbourage. Pests do like to live off objects, but they also um, live off other things. So a lot of pests actually live in birds' nests and um, uh, dead spaces, so up chimneys. Um, and this is what was found up this chimney. So this it can be a major source of pests that can then enter your museum, um, eat your objects and return back up the chimney. So you've got to make sure that your housekeeping is um, working, so you're accessing dead spaces regularly, you're removing dust, you're removing um, any buildup of materials. And this is the kind of damage they can cause. So they, they eat away at materials, causing holes, causing structural damage. And again, paper as well, silverfish and book lice. Um, most materials are so susceptible to some kind of pest. And even um, pests that don't cause problems. So this is a ground beetle. He doesn't necessarily eat um, historic collections. He's just wandered in by accident. However, he has become a home for a pest that does attack um, historic collections. Um, so any dead animals, dead pests, that have um, crawled under your floorboards and died or gone in your dead space and died can attract other pests which may um, move on to your collection so it's important to have them housekeeping regimes in place. Other pests such as uh, pigeons, birds, rodents, although um, they may not eat your collections they can um, cause damage um, uh, by pooing obviously and weeing um, but also rodents can um, chew through most materials. So it's important to make sure they do not get in. And dust, which is um, uh, one of the major um, visible things that I'm sure we've all noticed in our museums um, and our houses. Um, um, dust is not very nice to see. People don't like to see dust on objects but it is also very damaging. So accumulation of dust can cause 
chemical degradation, it can uh, cause um, local microclimates to build up on um, surfaces, it can cause a deterioration that way. So it's important to remove dust where it does build up. Um, so you can see here, um, someone has removed quite a lot of dirt and dust from a carpet. And it's important to think about where your dust levels are coming from. So is it um, more than usual? Have you noticed? Or is it about normal for your museum? So in this property, they found that their dust levels had increased. Um, so they investigated and found that the dust they were getting up was the same colour as the pathways that had just been um, redone in this orangey sandy material. So obviously visitors were bringing in a lot more um, of this dust once the paths had been redone. Um, so it's about thinking about the source and how to mitigate that. So after they found the source, they decided to um, change um, or heat seal their um, paths so that the dust was not quite as um, movable as it was. So here we are, you can see the lorry on the left kicking up a lot of dust and that's where um, the problem inside was coming from, where the dust levels, the increased dust levels were coming from. So it's important to um, also reduce the amount of dust getting in. So mats in front of doorways are really important. It's really important to clean them regularly so that they can do their job. Um, so having mats outside and inside and um, wherever people enter the building. And that will reduce the amount of dust and dirt um, going further into the building and towards your collections. And uh, it's important to think about um, where your museum is situated. So, for example, this museum is on a busy roundabout in London and on hot. And you can see here um, they get quite a lot of dust. Um, dust levels. You can see on the right, um, it's a golden colour, this uh, seat, but on the left it's more dull, so you can actually visibly see the dust levels on the left. Although you can't see it's dust, you can see something is obscuring the colours there. And this is inside the building, uh, on hot days and where the, where the dust levels were um, noticed. On hot days, um, Rome stewards were known to open the windows because it was getting very hot. However, because they were on that roundabout, the amount of dust coming through the windows um, on hot days was much more than it was um, during cold days when the windows were closed. So important to make sure your building envelope is sealed. It's um, harder nowadays with the increased um, ventilation needed for COVID. Um, and there may need to be some concessions made, but where possible, it's important to reduce dust levels by keeping windows and doors closed. Um, but bear in mind that visitors don't always go through closed doors. And where there's dust, there needs to be cleaning. I've already, already mentioned the sort of fine balance that needs to be um, kept between um, removing dust and not causing damage. Because um, obviously every time you clean something that is causing a minuscule amount of damage that will accumulate over time. So I will show you later on a few cleaning methods that whilst um, are not damage free, they are known to be less invest, uh, known to be less um, damaging um, than many um, common household cleaning methods, and therefore we call them conservation cleaning methods. And that's what we used on collections, as they minimise the amount of damage to objects whilst also removing dust. Um, so it's dust, but it's also ingrained dirt, um, particularly on the statue, you can see where they've cleaned a little bit of his arm. You can see the sort of more creamy color below the sort of gray. Um, so here's an example of uh, over cleaning or not 
great cleaning. So this this cleaning has caused damage. So someone has tried to polish the um, the brass studs on this chest, but in doing so, they have um, abraded and worn away part of the chest. You can see the um, lighter areas near the studs where they've worn away. But you can also see the green um, on the close up. You can also see the green creamy and residue around each of the studs, which is actually the polish. Um, so you don't see that straight away when you've polished something, but after a while, if you've not removed the polish properly, it can turn start to turn green and creamy, and you can see the residues there, which is not very um, visually attractive. Um, so this just shows the importance of cleaning things properly um, and carefully without causing damage. So that means um, not using um, everyday chemicals like, um, so this is a um, commercial um, dust, commercial polisher. Um, so commercial polishes, um, what we normally use at home with yellow dust cloths are not appropriate for historic collections. Many of them contain silicons, which although aren't visible, and um, straight away aren't noticeable, they stay on objects and can cause future deterioration problems. So we only use very mild um, cleaning, um, cleaning products um, without chemical compositions that are unknown. And another example of um, uh, damaging conservation cleaning. Um, so this used to be a silver tin you can see the silver, um, silver plated um, around the edges where it's not quite quite worn off. But someone's polished this so often that the thin outer layer of silver has worn off to show the brass underlay. So this is what we don't want. We don't want to clean something so often that or polish something so often that we lose the um, we lose. Um, the object, um, so the original appearance of the object. And um, to finish, this is um, this shows what we are we're talking about a bit. So um, this um, pot was pot vase was left to a cleaning lady um, uh, when she left when she retired. Um, so it sold for 92,000, but it might have sold for more than 1 million had it been in perfect condition. But the cleaner who lives in Chelsea, central London, polished it so much that she rubbed off most of the gold enamel. So by overcleaning, we are reducing the value of objects, not just aesthetically or monetary, but also the historical importance as well. Um, and moving on um, to conservation um, and why we need to know when to call in the professionals. Um, conservation can go very wrong. Um, so you've got to think about what you're doing um, and think about is it needed um, and will it damage the object. So we've had a few instances um, over the past years where um, poor conservation or botched conservations have reached the news. Um, and I think you might all remember this one, um, where um, a well-meaning um, lady tried to restore or conserve this um, fresco and uh, ended up um, changing it beyond repair. So this is not, we don't want this. We, we want to I'm sure you, like me, care about the objects in our care and we want to do the best for them. But we need to operate within our specialisms and within our, um, within our talents. Um, so it's important to know what you can do safely, what you need to think about and when you need to call in the experts. However, um, there have been some uh, um, popular stories to go along with this. Um, 
so it did it did reach headlines but it's also um been mimicked um in lots of different newspapers um so this changing different artworks to um to show the effect of um, the restoration in different artworks but there's also now um a strong tourist and um merchandise um running behind the botched restoration so it's not all bad but um it's best not to not to um destroy works of art in this way um i'll talk about this a bit later when we move on to talking about when to call in professionals but um there is a conservation register this is the old website actually on this powerpoint they've just updated it um and that's where you can find um conservators with specialisms who who can help you out on um any problems or any questions so that is so this is spencer and fry's um uh, um record in the conservation register so that is um the first part of our training so if there were any questions now um then we can cover a couple of them um if not we can have um, a five minute break or something like that for you to get a drink or just have a break and then um, we'll move on to um, the practical demonstrations um, after that. Is that Brilliant. right? <laughs> Charlotte, that was a really good, um, nice little summary of all the different things that we need to think about in terms of our collections. Are there any questions that anybody's got at this stage? Um. Thinking, uh, Katrina, about the situation at Bishop's Waltham, um, where a lot of our artefacts are stone and iron and things like that, um, uh, you know, I will go and look again at our paper, any, any paper we might have around, but, you know, the very nature of where we are, um, you know, if you've got those sorts of exhibits, like stone and things like that, you know, do we basically say, well we're fine sort of thing um, or should we be aware of something um with stone um it is more some of the more stable um, um objects uh, it's still vulnerable to physical damage so yeah. although I mean, obviously sorry, these are inside the museum obviously we're in an english heritage site which is a, another story but yeah so it, it, they're all inside um yeah. So they are protected yeah. to some... I'm talking about everything that's inside the museum. Cool, yeah. great. Um, yeah, so they're not, not quite as affected by RH and things like that. Um, still affected by dust and they can be quite hard to clean. Are they architectural stone pieces, is that? Or are they... Yeah, yeah some. The English yeah. Heritage uh, display is certainly architectural. Mm -hmm. Ours will be a, a range of things. I mean, I should probably go back now to the museum. I, I'm not the archivist, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I've come on this because I'm interested um, and find all sorts of things that we have to be careful about. Um, but um, I'm thinking, you know, um, uh, Katrina might might correct me or, or put me right, saying, you know, it, it feels like um, our exhibits, we're not talking about Ming vases, are we, Katrina, uh, as a general rule? Yeah, so it sounds like you've... Um... You've got quite a stable collection, which is great. You've you've got less to worry about. Um, you don't have to worry about pests. Um, I don't know. Do you have any pigments left on stones, or are, are they? I suspect not, but that's something we'll check. Yep. Yes, yeah. So that would be the only thing that might be light susceptible, but as it is, stone isn't. Um, so it's just yeah, mainly dust and physical damage, but. Um, Again, like you say, it's not like a very vulnerable vase. They are quite strong, but again, little chips could be, um, could you know, some damage could occur yeah. if you weren't careful, but <laughs> that's, yeah. Um, I think I saw a question in the chat 
Um, so we've got one from Greta um, about ceramics. Are ceramics affected by relative humidity, light, temperature, etc.? Yeah, again, so um, very similar to, to Nick's collection, ceramics, um, although they are very vulnerable to physical damage, um, they are not generally affected um, by temperature and light. They, it depends what their finish is. If they are, um, if they are glazed and like more like um, sort of porcelain, then they're not affected um, by light, not affected by RH. If you've got some porous, um, sort of more archaeological ceramics, um, depending on the if they were buried, then RH could potentially um, affect them in um, so salt efflorescence. So if they were buried in a sort of um, a particular geology, um, as they dry out or as they get damp, salts can um, effervesce on the surface and um, dissolve again. But that's that's quite it's not rare, but it's 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 it de very much dependent on where your collections came from, but it doesn't normally affect um, a glazed ceramics and um, so the more modern modern ceramics. Um, temperature wise, they're not that um, vulnerable either, um, unless you're getting into very, very high temperatures um, uh, and light, it, it's very much um, mostly isn't. However, it depends if depends on the decoration. So if you've got painted ceramics that aren't necessarily glazed or painted in particular organic compounds, um, then they might be susceptible. But odds are you they probably aren't. Um, but it's worth checking what exactly you've got in your collections. Uh, thank you. They're mostly um, 20th century studio ceramics and primarily glazed some have sort of unglazed bases but um by the sounds of it I don't need to worry too much no no I think you're probably um fine with them things and pests as well you don't need to worry about pests with ceramics and um, so yeah it's mainly just making Damage. sure they're physically safe <laughs> yeah because obviously that can be catastrophic um, yeah yeah so temperature wise they, they may be damaged in a fire but not in sort of what we call high temperatures. Yeah. Great, thank you. And then we've got a hand up from Sheila. Sheila, yes. do you want to do your question? Thank you. We've got, um, we're sort of a maritime museum, but not really. We've got four small wooden boats. They're sort of uh, four to six meters long, mm -hmm. two indoors, two outdoors. I don't, one of them's painted indoors. Um, the outdoor ones have got, I think, unsuitable covers on them to protect them. I don't know where to begin with them, actually, except one of the indoor ones was so dry that I've linseeded it twice with a help from a local boatman. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then someone else said that might be the wrong thing to do because it attracts dust. So help. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, in particular, big objects, big wooden objects like boats are, are difficult. Um, because often they are stored outside or um, they can't quite fit inside. Um, so yeah, the ones outside, it's about, obviously um, wood is susceptible to water damage. Um, so increased water can in, in attract pests um, and not just the pests that we get in museums. So if, the boat becomes very waterlogged, even wood louse might be tempted. Um, so yeah, anything you can do to pre protect it from, from being saturated, um, and that will reduce damage from water and damage from pests. Um, painting is something that um, people do employ on outdoor um, collections, and um, generally needs to be some thought about what's appropriate um, to your object. So would, what would originally have happened, um, what kind of paint, whether it would help in the long run. Mm. Um, linseed oil is a weird one because it's what traditionally boat, um, boat builders use, but it, it does attract dust if it's not, a, well, it, 
yeah even if it's applied well it, it can sometimes attract dust and then you've got problems with um yeah attracting dust and um degradation from them from that and unsightly dust particles that you then can't get out um i don't necessarily have a yeah, um a fix all option um there are waxes that you can use on wood um that might help but i'm not sure how they would um cope with previous linseed linseed um applications um have you noticed with the one that you've linseeded whether you are having problems with dust or does it does yeah. it look okay it, it it had been neglected for a very long time mm -hmm. and it was incredibly dry and brittle so it, it needed yeah. something yeah um, and maybe it's just a compromise between you know we didn't want it to fall apart but um then you're having to deal with dust the other thing yeah. we've got are lifeboat boards they're, um, they're about six feet high and they they're for commemorating um rescues we're on the coast mm -hmm. um and we've got about 25 of those now they were left in the out in the boat yard and some of them were damaged by sunlight. They're now indoors, but I'm not sure how to protect those either. They're painted. They're painted, yeah. Mm. Um, so they're inside now. Mm. Um, I'm guessing if they were stored outside, they probably, um, English weather, probably quite used to sort of damp conditions. Um, so they might not necessarily need a very controlled environment if they're quite used to that mm. however being inside will probably um, be good in the long run later on um, if you've not noticed have you noticed any particular degradation that you're worried about or uh, uh, well it, it's irreversible now but the sun damaged sun mm. that were on a south facing wall yeah um, I, and that's why I got them indoors but um, that's the only thing I've noticed. And a little bit of flaking paint because some of them are over 100 years old. And Yeah, okay. So, well, I uh, think... go Sorry, go on. <laughs> no, I just keep them indoors, guess, really is best. Yeah, so I think going forwards, I mean, you can't obviously um, undo um, the light damage that's, that's happened. Um, but going forward, um, yeah, protect from direct light or reduce light levels um, where you can. Um, look out for pests. Um, uh, um, yeah, look out for pests so that because um, there are quite a few pests that like wood. Um, the flaking paint, I'd maybe keep an eye on that just mm. in case it gets any worse. Um, it, if you are worried about it, it may be that um, some um, low key sort of conservation might be necessary just to sort of um, reattach that or stabilize that. Um, but yeah, I think it's more about monitoring their condition now that they've been moved inside, mm. making sure um, they're not subject to any more um, increased um, degradation mechanisms from light and pests. So and our age. Somebody wanted to varnish them and I wasn't keen on that. Yeah, I'd stay, I'd stay away from varnish um, mm, just because, yeah, varnish is quite, depending and what you use, it doesn't necessarily age very well, um, especially um, more um, um, more um, retail commercial brands. Um, potentially wax might be OK um, if you're worried about it, but I'd, I'd say probably you're fine without a surface coating um, and just monitor and, and and see see what happens and see see from there okay thank you yes nick can i, can I make an observation because i'm a woodworker so just so uh, please did do about, did you charlotte did you talk then about relative humidity at all or not um i did um say about they probably been quite in quite a damp environment um i think i know which museum you're from are you from deal yeah yeah, um, <laughs> I think I've seen them. Oh, right. um, <laughs> um, yeah, so um, it needs generally, I didn't go on to elaborate about what environment they need to be in now. Um, 
I would avoid very dry environments just because they've probably been in a damp environment. So if you dry them out mm. a lot, they will crack um, potentially. Um, so a mid-range RH is probably fine. Um, if it's a bit over um, that, then I think that's probably fine as well for them um, as they probably have been in a damp environment. And I think, I think your museum was erring on the damp anyway. Yeah. I'm not sure. Did you have, do you have um, environmental monitoring? No, we're, we're just tackling that now. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If that's what um, the process of doing. Great. Mm -hmm. So um, as you are able to, when you get able to monitor the environment, it'd be interesting to see what environment you've got. Um, uh, yeah, but I'd avoid, if, if you do have a dry environment, then I'd um, encourage something to be um, done about that, but um, otherwise... I don't think that's a danger, actually. <laughs> no, no, I think, I mean, I know you didn't have environmental monitoring, but I, I think it did err on the damper damper side. Um, yes, and just just keep monitoring. That's <laughs> that's the most important thing with any collections, really. If, you, if you're worried about something, yeah. it's best not to act straight away unless you can clearly see, like, something is eating this or... Um, there's water coming towards it. Um, with everything else, it's best to monitor before acting because once you've acted, some you can't always take it back. Mm -hmm. And even reversible, reversible treatments are not fully reversible. So um, for this sort of second section, Charlotte's going to show us um, some of the kind of practical skills um, about uh, cleaning objects and a little bit about handling objects. And again, if you've got questions, if you pop them in the chat, then we'll make sure that we don't miss them and we can feed them in at the right time. And as Charlotte said, normally this is done face to face. So this will be a new departure for us, discovering how we could do it over Zoom. If you want to see Charlotte close up um, and you're on gallery view, you can always change your view. Um, on my computer, it's at the top right. You can change your view to speak of you and then you'll get Charlotte nice and big on your screen. Right, Charlotte, over to you. Great, hey, thank you. Um, I apologise because um, I'm in my own flat, so I've had to use <laughs> the technology and equipment available to me. Um, so this for this section, the top of my head might be out the shot so that I can show my hands, but I'll try and keep my mouth in just in case anyone um, anyone needs um, extra lip reading or anything like that. Um, so yeah, as Katrina says, <laughs> I'm not. Um, not done this virtually before usually at this part of the training it's great to um, get everyone to have a go because we've got some um, uh, practice objects um, um, Spencer and Fry that we bring along to training so I've got them with me today and um, unfortunately um, it, it'll just be you watching me but um, as always um, please do put your questions in the chat and we can talk about anything um, more specific um, so I just want to talk about, about handling first before I go on to cleaning. Um, I'm sure as you um, are involved in museums, um, many of these things might not be new to you, um, but I just want to um, go over the sort of golden, golden rules type thing. Um, so if you're handling objects, um, then the first thing um, to think about is um, what equipment you need in order to handle them objects. So, um, as I've said about dust and pollutants um, and the problems with touching objects um, in museums and the wear and tear, um, we generally handle objects with either gloves or clean hands. Um, most commonly gloves, especially with metals, which can be very susceptible to um, um, specific corrosion um, involving fingerprints. The chemicals in our hands can cause um, corrosion in metals. So it's best to wear gloves for handling metals, but also for other objects as well, which can also be quite vulnerable to fingerprints. Um, for paper and textiles, um, it may be okay just to um, use clean hands rather than gloves. Some people find that actually wearing gloves with textiles and, and paper, it's not 
you don't have quite the motor skills to deal with it and um, particularly paper can tear quite easily. So if you want to use clean hands for paper, then that's fine. And um, the different types of gloves, I've got some with me today that we can use. I'm sure you've seen these in your museums. So nitrile gloves, which is the type of gloves that most people use now. Um, very similar to latex, um, except that they don't have, um, they don't give people allergic reactions. These are completely um, neutral. So most people can wear these. Um, you can wear cotton gloves. Um, the benefit of these is that they don't tend to sweat. Um, your hands to sweat. However, they don't always fit quite right. Um, and you do have to wash them regularly. With nitrile gloves, you do have to change them regularly um, as well so that you're not transferring dirt from one object to the other. Um, you can, if you've been wearing them for a while, they do start to sweat um, on the inside, no matter how, uh, how dry your hands are. So that's not always great, but if you take breaks and take your gloves off, wash your hands, it's not too bad. Okay, so I'm gonna wear my gloves for the demonstration as I would um, when dealing with collections. Um, so before handling objects or um, uh, dealing with objects, cleaning objects, important to have a workstation set up. Um, so I've got my work desk here. It's not quite as uh, big <laughs> as I would like, so I'm working in a small space. Um, but it's more important to pad out your workstation so that if, um, unfortunately, if you do misplace something or um, if something does go wrong with the handling, if it does drop or does bash, a bit then you've got a safety net here so I've got some um, bubble wrap and then over the bubble wrap I just put a smooth surface so something like Tyvek or tissue paper on top of that so that the bubble wrap doesn't catch and that's my workstation set up. Um, so for handling objects it's important to handle them um, in order to reduce the, um, the risk of physical damage so what we um, want to do is um, protect the object. So I'll get my first object here. So this glass object, obviously very vulnerable to physical damage. Um, you want to wear, what, um, use two hands for most objects, unless they're very small. Um, you want one on the bottom supporting the weight and one on the side so that it doesn't fall over. And that's your simple, um, simple handling technique. Um, if you've got more than one object you need to move, you can use trays or boxes as long as the objects are well packed and padded. Um, if you've got larger objects, then trolleys are useful, um, as well as um, equipment such as um, these sliders. So if you've got really heavy objects that you're struggling to pick up, these are great because you don't necessarily have to pick the object up. Of, we don't encourage people sliding objects across the floor. However, if you manage to lift up one end of your object, pop this underneath, these are designed to slide on the floor and cushion your object. So you can get them in different sizes and they're um, really useful for larger objects that are difficult to move. Um, so for more complex objects, another object, um, Handles are always very tempting because um, in our everyday lives, we use handles to pick up objects. However, with historic objects, um, particularly older ones, handles are generally actually one of the most weakest parts of the object. You don't know how strong it is. Um, so it's best not to pick up an object by its handle. It's best to do the, the base and side um, support and um, don't ever use the handle because if, if, the, um, if the joint does break and you're left you just holding a handle and the rest of the object's on the floor, it's um, not great. Um, so it's always best to um, assume that the handle is not going to support the weight. Put that down there. And again, if you, um, 
you don't need to use sliders for um, big objects, but if you've got an, you need enough people to move the object that you're going to move, don't struggle alone because you'll hurt yourself and you'll hurt the object. Um, for things like furniture, chairs, tables, it's important to lift using um, a strong structural element. Um, so for chairs, don't lift using their arms and um, lift them under the seat of the chair, making sure that uh, the seat doesn't pop out because some seats are separate, but the structure around, around the base of the chair rather than the arms, because again, the arms are the weak point. You need to find the strong structural point to lift. Um, if you have a complex object, um, such as this one. So this object has a lid. That. Ideally, you would remove any loose parts and carry them separately or carry them in a tray together. If you're moving something with loose parts, again, this is not a historic object, so I'm just going to show you. Things can move as you're you're moving it causing damage so it's it's best to move any loose parts beforehand before moving an object just in case and if things do have moving parts um so for example this object has a lid it doesn't come off um it's best to make sure that um you're holding it closed so it doesn't flap um it's not too much of a problem with this object because um, gravity will keep it in place. But for things um, with opening doors, such as cupboards and things, if they're going to flap open when you're moving them, um, you can tie them closed with cotton tape. Um, so don't use sticky tape or anything like that, sure you wouldn't. Um, but um, uh, some um, white cotton, unbleached cotton tape, you can tie around to make sure the doors don't fly open because um, that can cause damage and be a bit of a surprise when you're carrying stuff. And anything that has had previous damage, so for example, this bowl has been previously stuck back together here, be aware of what that means for carrying the object. So which parts have been made more vulnerable? And if there is a part that you think is more fragile because of the join, it's important to support that and make sure that you don't put pressure on that part as it, it's the most vulnerable part. And it's important to move things as infrequently as possible. Um, so think about where you're moving stuff to and from. Think about doors, um, any obstacles, make sure your route is clear. Um, if you're having to pick up an object, put it down, pick it up, pick, put it down. It may um, be good to rethink what you're doing. So do you need to pick up and put down this object? so many times, is there something you can do just to move it once to the correct place? Um, so think about things like that to um, reduce the risk of physical damage. Um, for other um, vulnerable things, for example, um, paper objects, photographs, as well as trays, it's best to avoid handling as much as possible. So if you can get a sacrificial piece of paper or something like that, piece of card, and then you can lift quite safely without, um, without putting any pressure on the object itself. That's important to think about. And obviously your health and safety when you're um, moving objects. So um, I've said before, don't move anything that's too heavy without help. Um, if there, there are some objects that have been treated in the past that have potentially dangerous chemicals, um, for example, lots of taxidermy is treated with arsenic by the Victorians. Um, it's important that you don't risk inhaling that. Um, so wear correct PPE, things like that. Um, so anything that you do suspect has arsenic in it, you can wear um, an FFP2 mask. Or for things um, potentially with radioactive materials, you need to make sure you know um, know that they're stored properly before attempting to move things like that. So just think about your own health and safety as well. Right, so let's move on to a bit of cleaning. So I'm going to start with dry cleaning and this is to remove surface dust that we were talking about. Um, and this can be done with most, most materials. Um, 
So first off, we've got um, cloths that we can use to remove surface dust. So I've got a variety here. Um, most of these are just white, soft cloths. Um, I've got a cotton cloth here. This is a glass cleaning cloth, um, which is um, meant to be specifically for glass cleaning. And I've got a microfiber cloth here, which um, used to be quite popular, not quite so popular because it can snag, um, but all of these are much better than um, the traditional yellow dusters, which um, can leave quite unsightly um, yellow fragments on materials. So these should, um, can, can be used to dust objects um, as long as they, um, so I would use these to dust objects that um, have um, flat surfaces or um, things that don't, so not 3D effects. So for example, I could dust my desk with this because <laughs> um, it's, it's a flat surface, it's quite wide. Um, it doesn't have any um, vulnerable points that could be snagged. Um, so any lifting veneers or anything. Um, you can um, dust larger ceramics with this. So for example, you can, you can dust ceramics like that with the cloth, just making sure you remove the dust quite easily. I'm sure we, we all know sort of um, ideals behind using a cloth for dusting. It's not that much different from using your normal yellow duster, just making sure that there's nothing that can snag. So making sure all labels are out the way and making sure that your surface is robust enough to use a cloth. Um, so you're not gonna remove any, any of the surface like veneers. Um, but for anything that has any kind of 3D surface decoration, so, um, um, so for example, something like this, I um, don't know whether you can see, but there's quite a few ridges, um, things that a cloth might not pick up. So dust could settle in the little grooves, um, obviously anything on a bigger scale than this as well with grooves or decorative carvings, a cloth's not gonna get all the, all the way in there. So that's um, where brushes come in. I've got a selection of brushes here. So this is the, one of the stiffest brushes we use. It's called a hog's hair brush. And it's got a bit of, um, uh, it's quite, it's not very stiff, but it's got a bit of spring back. So it's quite stiff. So we use this on things like wood, um, anything that's quite robust, but you need the brush to get in the carvings or things like that. The next softest, softest we've got um, is a pony hair brush. So use on things that are a bit more fragile and they don't necessarily need the, the stiffness. Um, so this, it's, it's quite soft. So um, we can use this on things like books and um, anything that um, is a bit too vulnerable for the, the stiff hog's hair. And then even softer is the goat's hair brush, which is um, really quite, I'm just dropping things. Um, nice and soft and, and that again can be used on vulnerable materials just to get dust out. And we've got this um, really exciting brush that I've not used yet but it's got a little bent bent head which I presume is um, useful in um, getting into corners that uh, a straight brush might not be able to get into and this is quite similar to the hog's hair, I think it is hog's hair. Um, so it just gives you that extra extra angle to get in, um, which is quite unusual. With these, um, it's often, I haven't done this yet because these are new brushes, but um, it's advisable, um, the brush necks are metal. So to avoid physical damage before using them, um, it's useful to tape the metal near the bristles, just in case you catch the object um, with them. Um, so instead of scratching with the metal, the, um, the tape, will um, give a, an extra layer of protection. So I haven't done that with these, um, but it is worth doing. So masking tape or um, electrical tape, something like that, that'll give a bit of a buffer. 
and it's important to clean um, again with your cloths once you've used them and your brushes it's important to clean them before going on to the next next cleaning otherwise you're just transferring dirt from one one object to another and um, so to use brushes on an object um, so you could potentially use a hog's hair brush on metal the metal grooves so just flicking the brush out flicking the dust out like that getting it out of the holes so hog's hair you could use on metal you can use on wood so like, like this um, mock panelling, getting into the grooves, flicking the dust out, moving systematically across the piece, making sure the dust is being removed. So I'd use the more softer brushes on things like um, ceramics because it just, it just glides nicer over the surface. So you can do that on the ceramic and on glass materials as well. Um, for cleaning things like paper and books, so I've got my padded surface here. Okay, I'm put my book on top. Normally, if you do have a large book collection, um, if they've been displayed on shelves, so closed like this, closed, all you need to do um, regularly is. Um, is to clean the outsides of the of the book. So I'm going to use my pony hair. So you go from spine to fore, fore edge, brushing the um, dust out of the pages, down, fore edge, and then again from spine to fore edge. You might want to um, brush the, um, the hard cover. So going from the centre of the spine out. Just making sure the dust um, is removed in a systematic way. Um, if you do need to clean the inside of the book, so for example, if um, you've noticed pest infestations or um, mould and you want to give a thorough cleaning, um, the book needs more support for um, being open. So it's best to have, um, I mean, you can make these yourselves or you can buy them. It's um, just a a cushion filled with beads or some sort of padding. So we can put the book on there and as it opens it just gives the spine a bit more support like that. And again you're going from the spine out to get the dust away from the spine. You don't want to push the dust further into the spine. Arnett, um, just a little question from Tina about how would you clean the brushes before you use them again? You might have been about to come on to that. So. Yeah, um, so generally clean with um, soap and water. So um, make sure, yeah, um, make sure. So I'll come on to wet clean now so it's later, but you can use the same detergent. So this is quite a mild detergent. Um, you can use Circa with water. And just um, make sure you're washing out your brush. You can do it by hand in the water. Make sure you rinse it properly and then leave it to dry. Um, so you're just removing them, whatever dust is remaining in the, in the hair. So soap and water is fine. Um, right. So you can use a vacuum as well. Sorry, this is my vacuum today because I don't have. This is the nozzle of my uh, my normal vacuum, but obviously I wouldn't be able to use it on the virtual anyway because you wouldn't be able to hear anything I'm saying. Um, but you can use a vacuum. So any of the dusting, so um, as you're brushing the dust off an object, instead of just brushing it onto your work surface, you can brush it into the nozzle of a vacuum. So for example, if I was brushing this guy again, um, it's easier with um, larger objects because they're not going to go flying um, but you just position your um, vacuum nozzle sort of nearby and you're just gently brushing the dust towards the end of the vacuum. So you're not putting the vacuum directly on the surface because that would be too much pressure. Um, it's just there as a sort of extraction for the dust in the atmosphere so that the dust doesn't settle anywhere, you're removing it completely. 
So there are there are different um, vacuums you can use. There's there's a, something called a museum vac, which is quite a small, compact thing, um, with an adjustable suction, which is good for sort of small objects and books. Um, there are there are um, backpack hoovers and waste hoovers that you can get that are useful for um, so, for example, in historic houses, if you if you have to take the cleaning materials to the object, she could have a backpack or a, or a waste hoover. Although um, the waste hoover that is traditionally used is now not being made anymore. However, um, um, the SIBO um, vacuums, SIBO vacuums, S-E-B-O, are um, more and more being used for collections care. Um, it's better to have one with a variating suction. However, it's you can um, alter your own vacuum to um, create suction. Um, weirdly, by putting um, a hose pipe down your um, your vacuum tube, um, you can reduce the suction of your vacuum if you're worried about it being too vigorous. Um, but it's always um, well, for carpets. You can use and floors, obviously, you can use the, the head. Um, however, mostly with collections care and cleaning objects, you'll be using the, the hose and the, um, the end of that. Um, if you are worried about losing things of the hoover, hopefully you're not because anything you're cleaning should be quite stable. Um, we use muslin, muslin patches. Um, so you can either put that over the end of your nozzle, secure it with elastic band, and that will let dust go up, but it'll catch anything that detaches. You can also use these to um, see whether um, a material actually needs to be cleaned, particularly textiles. So you can dry clean textiles in the same way. So we would use a soft brush for textiles, either goat's hair or pony brush. I've got a textile here. And a textile here. Lay it out a bit. So as long as the textile is robust, you could potentially um, dry clean it. This is more to do with upholstery rather than costume. I wouldn't advise cleaning costume at all unless you've spoken to a specialist. However, if you've got some um, robust upholstery, um, then you may feel confident in um, doing some dry cleaning. Um, but if you wanted to see whether dry cleaning was necessary, you can use a piece of muslin. And I've lost my elastic band. But pop the bit of muslin um, at the connection of where your, um, uh, your the end of your vacuum meets the hose. Do a, um, a square of your textile um, systematically. So depending on the size of the object, you'd want to do a sample square. So on this, I'd say maybe 10, cent, um, 10 centimeters squared, maybe something like that. Only a small section. You'd have a look at your muslin and see if there was any dust on the muslin, any um, fibres. If, if there were dust, then um, it means that, yeah, your textile could do with cleaning. If there are fibres from the object, then I wouldn't clean it because obviously there's something happening there. The, the textile isn't as robust as it looks. Um, so although it might be dusty, it's actually causing damage to the object as well. Um, so it's better to do a sample and see what's happening rather than just cleaning the whole object and then thinking, oh, we've lost quite a lot of fibres there or um, actually we didn't get quite that much dust so it didn't really need doing and I might have caused damage for no reason. Um, so it's great to um, have a look at that. With textiles as well, if something is quite robust, but you're not, you, you're still a bit worried, um, you can put monofilament gauze over the surface of your textile and, and, um, and that, I don't have any with me at the moment, um, but it's just a gauze material that you can go over 
it will stop any loose threads from being sucked, um, but you can still sort of lightly brush and hoover up the dust. But again, I am demonstrating with the costume here because it's all I have, but this is primarily for upholstered fabrics, which are, are more robust um, and potentially carpets, things like that. Um, costumes are generally more vulnerable and more um, valuable, well, not more valuable, but um, there's less of them left. So um, I think it's important to um, talk to a textile conservator before doing anything to them. Uh, so that's brushes and vacuums. The other dry cleaning thing that we have are um, these sponges. So we've got a few different varieties. I can get it out of the bag. So this is just a normal makeup sponge from Boots, which can be quite useful. So it's dry cleaning, you use it dry. Um, so think for things um, like things on paper. Um, things like that, you just use it dry. And it doesn't leave any residue. It doesn't cause um, a lot, well, it will cause tiny bits of damage like the wear and tear that cleaning always does, but it doesn't cause massive damage, but it just gets surface dust up that doesn't necessarily, won't necessarily be brushed off. It's a bit more ingrained, it might need a sponge. So that's the makeup sponge. And um, this is called a smoke sponge, which does the same thing, um, except that it is a conservation material, rather, whereas the makeup sponges are just something similar that can be got um, from a local shop and um, so this does the same thing just be careful with it obviously um, like anything else just be gentle but you can use it to get up slightly ingrained dirt so you can see these ones they have been used on something else before you can see the dirt being picked up there and this is something new that I haven't used before but it's it's in the same vein it's called the conservative sponge and again, it's meant to get the dirt up without damaging the object. And something similar still, but also slightly different, is something called green stick. And this is sort of like a, a putty. Um, it does the same thing as a sponge. You can use a little bit of it, roll it into a sausage and roll it, roll it over your material um, just to get the surface dust up. Um, However, I'd only recommend using these after dry cleaning, after the um, after the brush and um, potentially cloth, depending on whether you think there's more dust dirt to get up. Um, so, for example, we used we've even used um, some of these on paneling, um, paneling and walls, and um, they're good at getting pencil marks out. So things like that, just and um, not necessarily just surface dirt, but marks that you know aren't meant to be there. So if the child's got loose <laughs> with a pencil, as is often the case, um, this should just um, help to take the pencil mark out. And then there. So we'll move on. So that was dry cleaning, which is the always the thing that you should start with. And um, dry cleaning is the least interventive. It's um, less likely to cause damage, and it is necessary for most objects because most objects will um, have a layer of dust um, due to the very nature of them being displayed. Um, however, there are other things you can do. So we'll move on to polishing. So I mentioned um, pollutants and tarnish for a particular silver tarnishes quite a lot, depending on um, what materials are nearby. So um, sulfur compounds cause um, the tarnishing of silver. And these are released by things like wool textiles. Um, so if you display your wool, your, your silver objects 
in a display that also has wool textiles or a wool wool based um, material as the backing fabric of your display case, then you may notice your silver objects tarnishing. Um, so to remove tarnish, so this is a silver object, you can use a silver object. So you can see this silver plated object, you can see particularly in here, the darker color there, and that is silver sulfide tarnish. So you might not want the darker color, you might want to return it to silver. However, it's important to know that every time you polish silver, you are removing a bit of that silver. So we saw that photo in the PowerPoint where that tin used to be silver plated and is now mostly brass with a bit of silver around the edges. That's what happens if you over clean silver objects. So it's best to remove pollutant sources rather than have to continually clean your silver objects, polish your silver objects. So if you notice that your silver objects are tarnishing quickly and over and over again, you need, you know there's a pollutant there somewhere and it's best to find it and remove it um, rather than, or remove your silver objects from that case um, rather than continually polish your silver. You shouldn't need to polish your silver um, that regularly. So there are different polishes. So the one that we recommend is the Goddard's long-term silver polish cloth. So this is um, an abrasive cloth. Um, so there's an abrasive in here that removes the, um, the silver sulfate. Let's see if it does any. So it does involve some elbow grease. We've got to work on it a while. We'll get it to a point where you can maybe see a difference. There we are. So you can see where the W is, there's another lighter spot there. So that's um, removed some of that silver sulfide tarnish. So you do that with the rest of the object. I won't do that now, otherwise I'll have no silver sulfide to clean off in the next <laughs> session. Um, like I said, this is an abrasive cloth, so it is removing that silver sulfide. It doesn't convert it back, it removes it and reveals the silver below. Um, however, it is, it has been found in testing that it is the least abrasive. So it's the, um, it's the most gentle of the treatments. There are other things. So liquid tarnishes and um, tarnish removers. So Silvo, um, and I'm sure, oh no, I've lost my tin of Brasso, but I'm sure we've all seen Brasso. Um, we don't recommend um, things like that, especially Brasso. Um, pastes in particular, they do work. Um, however, they are a bit more abrasive than the cloths. But if you don't clean the residue off properly, you get, you are left with, it might be quite hard to see, but this little lady has um, white residue in her little grooves. Yeah, that's, you can see some, hopefully see some. That means, so you can't see it straight away, but she's been cleaned by Brasso in the past. And um, it takes a while for the white residue to show up. Um, so you've, you've polished your object, you've left it, you think it looks good, you come back to it, and there's white residue in all the grooves where you've not cleaned your Brasso out properly. Um, so that's the risk of that. It, not only is it very abrasive, the paste, it's also very hard to clean off, and then you've got that unsightly residue as well. Um, okay. However, there are exceptions to that rule. So not, not with silver um, or brass, but with, um, with metals with more um, that corrode rather than tarnish. Um, so things like um, iron based metals, if you notice rust, red rust, um, we, do, we do tend to use um, uh, paste polishes to remove that because rust can be very 
damaging and you need to remove the active active area of the rust um, before it gets um, quite deep. So there are many different types of polishes. Um, so it's important to only use these if there is active corrosion. Um, so I wouldn't use these just to because you want it to look all nice and shiny. Um, but if there is corrosion you need to remove, so it's all red and powdery, then these can be used with um, cotton swabs or um, in cases of quite tough corrosion, um, fine wire wool. Um, so we've got prelim, which is um, again a, a paste, an abrasive paste. We've got peak. There's also solvol autosol. Um, so these you need to be used with moderation. And like the Brasso, which we don't use anymore, um, we need to clean it off properly, otherwise it will lead, leave a residue. So um, I'll come to wet cleaning in a minute, but you do need to remove these pastes with wet damp swabs after you've used them. Otherwise they will, um, will cause deterioration problems in the future. So we don't want to solve one problem and cause another. Right. So wet cleaning. So wet cleaning is, is probably the most interventive thing that um, we would do to an object. We wouldn't wet clean all objects. Um, so obviously paper, we wouldn't because <laughs> it generally disintegrates. Um, textiles are generally only wet cleaned by professionals. Um, so I personally wouldn't clean a wet, text, a wet clean a textile and you shouldn't either um, unless you have been trained in textile conservation. And even then, it's very rare to wet clean a textile. The textile has to be very robust and it needs to um, uh, be very, very soiled um, to be wet cleaned. Um, however, for things more stable, so ceramics and glass, wet cleaning is an option to remove dust and dirt. And even metals, as I've mentioned, you need to wet clean to remove polish residues. You can also wet clean metals to clean them, um, to clean ingrained dust if you think the dry cleaning isn't working. However, it's important to limit the use of water, um, particularly with metals, as water can cause corrosion. That is what causes corrosion, it stimulates it, increases the risk. So instead of wet cleaning, I suppose we should call it like damp cleaning because you are really limiting the amount of water and you're making sure you dry thoroughly afterwards. Um, so wet cleaning, always use um, so purer water than tap water. So deionized water, um, distilled water, something like that. It can be bought at most shops. It's not expensive. Tesco does this. Um, and use a very mild detergent. So I've shown you this before, something like Circa, um, basically something that's approved for people with um, sensitive skin. Um, and you use very little detergent, um, just a tiny drop, just to make, to make sure that um, there's a surfactant that can attract the dirt and dust away from the object. So this is my mixture that's um, already been made up of water and um, circare. So when I say we really limit the amount of water, this is kind of what I mean. So we don't just bathe, we don't put it in a washing up bowl. Um, we generally use swabs. So obviously you can buy cotton wool bowl, cotton wool, um, cotton wool um, buds, um, at the shop, but you can also make your own. Um, so just buying cotton wool and some cocktail sticks, get a little clump, put it on the end, and then use friction between your fingers to roll it on the end. It's been a while since I've done this over lockdown, so um, I'm not very good. <laughs> Takes a bit of practice to get, get it on properly, and you've got your cotton wool. And the good thing about this is that you don't have to throw away the whole thing after each thing. You use the cotton wool on the end until it gets dirty. You throw that away, you can use the stick for the next one. So I 
you just dampen your cotton wool a little bit like that and get an object to work on. And then you just work systematically over the object. This isn't very dirty, so you're not going to see a difference, but um, hopefully you should see a difference and you just work systematically over the object. When your cotton wool's dirty, actually it's dirty than I thought, you probably still can't see it, it's a little bit grayer. Um, remove the cotton wool, make yourself another one, carry on. Because you've used detergent, um, it's best with objects to rinse afterwards. So you'll have one bottle with um, deionized water and detergent. You'll have another bottle with just deionized water. And it's important once you've cleaned the object to rinse the object in the same way. So again, with cotton wool balls, don't just rinse it under water, cotton wool, water, and then that will wash the remains of the soap off because we don't want to leave any any chemicals in there even though it's very mild we want to remove as much as possible because we are very aware of what things can do over time so you can do that with ceramics you can do that with with glass um, metals as well so this poor little lady um, if i wanted to try and remove her brasso that's what i would do it would take a while because brass is very stubborn to get out um, but I would use swabs to get in the little grooves um, to clean the brasso out and then I would rinse with, with just water swabs. Um, if you have larger ceramics you can use and glass as well you can use your glass cleaning cloth and just slightly dampen the end and um, use it like that if you think swabs are going to take a long time um, but it's still important to limit the amount of water you're putting on any one time after you've cleaned an object and um, if the object's very big you, you'll probably want to do it in stages so do a little section clean it with clean it with the soap mixture rinse it and then dry it before moving on to the next bit if it's a small object, you can probably just um, wash, rinse and dry and it'll be fine. But it's remembering that actually water can have quite negative effects on, on sub some objects. So it's weighing up that balance of this object needs to be cleaned because it's potentially deteriorating because of the, the ingrained dirt and not introducing another deterioration factor with the water. And you can wet clean other things such as um, uh, particularly marble bus, things like that. You've got to be careful with stone because some stones do dissolve in water. So it's important to know what exactly, um, if you've got statues or mon uh, small stone sculptures, um, it's important to know exactly what they're made of before going down the wet cleaning roll um, because you don't want to dissolve your object. Um, marble is generally okay. And you saw earlier on the PowerPoint a photo of someone wet cleaning a marble bust with swabs. Okay, so that's wet cleaning. And the only thing I've got left to talk about is um, uh, protecting. So after you've cleaned your objects, um, there is a way to protect them from further deterioration or some, some of them from some deterioration. Uh, and that's with a layer, a, a surface protection layer. Um, so this is particularly with wood and metal. Um, ceramics and glass are quite stable anyway, as we've discussed, so they don't, don't need a surface layer. However, if you're wanting to protect your silver object from further tarnish or um, your other metals from corrosion, a surface um, coating can actually help um, to protect them. Um, so we use Renaissance wax, microcystine wax, and you can um, uh, brush or wipe that on, leave it for a bit and then buff it up. So using, using a cotton, clean cotton cloth, you can buff it once you've applied it. And that leaves a surface coating that will give it some protection from tarnish. It won't protect it forever, for always, but it will inhibit that corrosion or tarnish for longer. And with wood, there are furniture polishes that you can use. 
um, so National Trust Furniture Polish or Herald's um, traditional wax polish. Um, and again, um, uh, with things like floorboards, if you're in a historic house or um, sometimes panelling um, or um, furniture objects, you can wax them. So you'd use um, a cloth or something like this, mesh cloth, um, pop it on and then leave it for a few minutes, a few seconds and then buff it off. Um, as well as a cloth, you can, can use sort of brushes made for polish. Um, and again, you use one to apply the polish and one to buff it and remove the excess polish. Because like we said with linseed oil, actually any wax, if not applied properly or applied too thickly, it will attract dust and it will. So it's about balancing um, what's protecting and what's increasing damage. Just um, a question on that one, um, Charlotte. Um, somebody's just asked, can you do the same for brass fingerboards on doors? So I think that's probably about the wax as well, isn't it? Yes, yeah, yeah. So um, so brass microcrystalline wax. Um, so it can um, protect against fingerprints, things like that. Um, to be properly protective, it's got to be a sort of a homogenous layer. That's very hard to get because obviously you can't see the wax when it's applied. Um, and it does need to be reapplied about, depending, depending on how often something handled or touched, um, maybe about once a year. Um, so yeah, definitely you can, you can use that, um, apply it with a, a cloth or a brush and then remembering to buff it to remove the excess. So yeah, microcystine wax for anything brassy. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and then just lastly, before just talking a bit about professional things, we've got these um, newer things, which are tarnish inhibitors. So these are bags that you can put your um, silver in. Um, and the material the bags are made out of um, um, includes a material that actually absorbs sulfur. So prevents it from getting to the silver and tarnishing it. Obviously, these aren't any good if your object's on display, because then you won't be able to see it. But if your object's in storage and you just don't want to have to worry too much about pollutants, then these um, may be able to protect your object. Um, they will run out over time um, as corrosion inhibitors or corrosion and tarnish absorbers. Um, the more tarnish they, the more pollutants they absorb, um, the, um, the less affected they get. So they will run out after the time, but it's a, a possibility if you do have that problem. So I believe these, um, these probably um, are made of activated charcoal, which is a known sulfur um, absorber. And I think um, that's it on um, the sort of practical side. Um, just a few things about sort of when to call in the professionals. I mean, I've, I've sort of been talking about it all the way through, but just to summarize. Can I, um, sorry, Charlotte, oh, I'll yeah, just exactly. I'll stop you there because I've got a few other questions that are sort of about products yeah. and then one that will lead on to that question about when to call in the experts. Be quite right. So um, somebody said um, they've got a large leather shoe where the leather has dried out. How would you clean that? Okay, is um, how would I clean it? So leather, um, depending on how dry it is, if it's actively flaking, and um, then I'd be worried about cleaning it. Um, if it's if it's just quite dry, um, but there's there's no sort of active flaking, um, then any of the sort of soft brush would be fine. Um, upper vacuum. Um, so sort of like the textiles, treat, treat leather sort of more like a textile than, um, than anything else because it's been used like a textile. Um, but if, if, if it is quite flaky and things, I would, I would not clean that myself. Um, I think that's, that's when, um, well, well, when to consult a leather expert because um, they will know more. 
I know there's um, some, uh, there are leather dressings um, that supposedly restore leather and um, stop it drying out. However, I'm not, I don't think that's what a conservator would recommend um, generally because leather dressings, commercial leather dressings, they don't necessarily know the makeup and they may do more long-term damage. So they might make it look okay for now, but they may do more long-term damage as it um, ages. So I think if, if it is in need of something more than dry clean and it is flaking, then definitely worth consulting a leather conservator. Um, and then a question about the silver keeper bags. Um, are they suitable for archeological silver items? Um, yeah, um, that's an interesting question. Um, obviously, archaeological silver is um, is generally because um, silver is not quite as um, reactive as the baser metals. It does tend to survive sort of more or less um, in its sort of form as it was. So similar to gold objects, but not quite as much. Um, yeah, I think it, I think it would be fine. Um, just bearing in mind if if there are um, um, so if there is any because silver objects are never just pure silver like gold objects are never pure gold objects they're always alloyed with something. Silver generally alloyed in, with copper or it's plated on top of copper. Um, so it's just bearing in mind if there are other corrosion project products from other other metals whether that would impact. Um, so if there were um, flaking bits, putting it in the bag, you just have to be careful not to, yeah, not to physically damage the object. But um, yeah, if, if the silver is pretty intact and you're worried about tarnishing, then I think the silver tarnishing bags would be, would be, would work just the same um, to prevent that chemical um, activity, the tarnishing. Um, and then just um, the names of the um, products you said for protecting wood after cleaning. I think that was the National Trust Burnage College. Was there another one as well? Yeah, so um, I've not personally used the National Trust Burnage College um, because I know the National Trust actually use this. <laughs> so, well, that's quite telling. Um, so, Harrens. Um, yeah, so Harold's Wax um, is um, generally used um, on floors. Um, but also good on other wooden objects. Um, just making sure that the objects you use them on are suitable for waxing. So if you've got a polished object, so that has lacquer or some other coating on it, do, don't wax that object. Um, or similarly, if you have an object that hasn't been waxed or a floor that hasn't been waxed, um, don't wax that object either. So it's about making sure that um, uh, you were doing the suitable treatment for the object. So um, it's hard, hard, to, hard to explain um, without sort of showing examples, but you don't want to put wax on top of varnish because it just won't, won't look good. It won't do anything, won't do any good. Um, you would you need to either put it on something that's already been waxed or make the decision if something hasn't been waxed it's got nothing on it you either make that decision to wax it or not and leave it um but it doesn't it's it's more yeah so it's more about not making wood dry out but it's on wood that has a lot of surface activity so sort of surfaces of furniture and floors um, so floors in particular, it, it protects, does that sort of surface protective layer that wears out and you reapply. Um, and in particular, panelling near windows as well, which can dry out quite a lot due to sunlight. I don't know whether that helps at all. <laughs> I basically just said, yeah, um, uh, yeah, if you know what, yeah, it's, it's difficult because you need, you need to sort of look into the history of your objects and make sure you're doing the right thing. Um, and then just to check on the name of the brand for the silver, silver sulfide inhibitor bags. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, the two I've got here, 
are um, uh, Haggerty and Town Talk Polish Company Limited. I've not used them personally, um, but they um, they do include the material that I have used. So in um, um, activated charcoal that I was talking about is does does work. It does absorb sulfur um, for a set period of time, and then you need to change it when it becomes saturated. Um, so they should they should do do some something. Brilliant. And then nicely leading us on to the last little bit about when to call in the experts. Um, Miranda was saying that they've got a copy of drawing by Vern Jones on tracing paper. A small scrap of the tracing paper is broken away. Should we give this to a conservator to repair or repair it ourselves if we've attended a short one? Yeah, so that is an example of something that I would definitely go to a paper conservator with. Um, as a preventive conservator myself, I, I very rarely actually repair things. Um, I do conservation cleaning, I do preventive conservation, so pests and environmental monitoring. Um, I was originally trained in interventive conservation, but I haven't practiced for a while in interventive conservation. So it's being aware of your limitations um, and your knowledge. So I'm very aware of that. Um, but if anything needs repairing, it needs repairing in the right way. And paper conservators will know exactly what materials um, can be used um, adhesives as well as um, different papers that will not cause further future damage to objects. Um, and I'm obviously not saying that you <laughs> would repair it with sellotape, but obviously I've seen a lot of things that were repaired in, uh, you know, um, the 20th century with sellotape that obviously was not <laughs> the right thing to do. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 Specialist conservators have, have the training, um, they do research, they deal with similar objects all the time, things that are very simple to them, such as, you know, like you say, repairing a little corner, look simple to us, but actually can be quite complex if you don't understand the materials and the um, long-term consequences of them. Um, and that's, that's where we need professional conservators specialists. We, we are not able to be specialists in all areas. Um, so, you know, individual materials, textiles, books, um, stone, leather, they have people who have trained for years in that particular subject who, you know, I can know the basics of all these materials, you can know the basics of all these materials, we can do enough to do the surface cleaning, um, which I've just talked about now, we may be able to do more under guidance from professionals. Um, however, there are limitations um, and that's when we call in um, the specialists who can do repairs. They can do more intricate and interventive cleaning without worrying too much about the consequences because they've, they've done the research and they've done the learning and they've dealt with these objects before. Um, so you can you can find these specialist conservators, like I said, on the conservation register, the Icon Conservation Register, um, or you know Spencer and Fry. We may be able to recommend particular um, specialists that we've worked with before. Um, but yeah, it's it's always always good to know when to when to go to them. And I'd say any repairs, you'd um, you'd go to um, a specialist conservator. Was there any other questions, Katrina, or is that? Just um, one more that was about um, looking at protecting larger features. Can you recommend the company who makes doorway protectors? Because they've just had rooms restored in a working building. Doorway protectors. Um, uh, I might need more information <laughs> to um answer that um correctly um is it to protect 
doorways during work or to protect a surface of the doorways or um sorry <laughs> Who, who's asked that? Is that Anna do you want to say a bit more uh, yes, thank you. Sorry. Yeah, just literally the, the actual doorways themselves. Sometimes you can see people have perspex corner, you know, to the oh. and and I've just got to look for some and it's just whether you recommend a particular company or I just go and find um, find someone who makes them bespoke. It's just whether you know of anyone. Um, I don't offhand, but I can um, I can ask my colleagues to see if they've worked with um, with someone who's done that because I know um, some of my colleagues have worked for English Heritage and they do have some perspex um, sort of things. So yeah, I can I can ask and um, uh, get back to you maybe. Uh, um, yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm gonna send out a handout anyway, I'm sure, um, Katrina, um, so I can send out that information as well, if that would help. Brilliant. Okay. Um, Charlotte, was there anything more that you were? No, I think um, I think that's all I had um, planned. So I hope that was um, useful in some way. Um, and I hope, yeah, you all asked the questions that you wanted to. Um, you know, if, the, if there's any more, then obviously Spencer and Fryer um, can be contacted through um, uh, Southeast Museum Development Programme or independently, whatever, <laughs> whatever works.